28 of Surat Ibrahim. Um, I think you guys know by now, Ibrahim alayhi salam is the love of my life. Um, <laughs> if I can say that. Uh, SubhanAllah, this is the class that we're going to be talking about Ibrahim alayhi salam. I'm not going to be talking too much about his story. I think we covered that not enough because it's never enough, but I think we covered that a lot. Um, so inshallah, I just want to get to the main points um, of these ayats, inshallah. Um, the past few classes, we spoke about the, the amthal that Allah SWT uses. The Prophet Muhammad SAW gives amthal as well. And what are amthal? This is something that I never understood, especially when I started reading the Quran with an English translation. Like, what are parables? Like, that sounds like such an ancient term. But parables, subhanAllah, they're just analogies that Allah SWT hits, like darab, that Allah SWT throws at us. Um, and so, for example, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, مَثَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِ الَّذِي يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ كَمَثَلِ الْأُتْرُجَّةِ رِيحُهَا طَيِّبُ وَتَعْمُهَا طَيِّبُ Can't remember if he said mu'min or Muslim, but he says the example of the believer who recites the Qur'an is like the example of the citrus fruit. It smells good and it tastes good. And then he says, وَمَثَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِ الَّذِي لَا يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ or sorry, So he says, and the example of the believer who who recite who does not recite the Quran is like the example of the date. It tastes good, but it doesn't have a uh, but it doesn't have a smell. And then he says, and the example of the hypocrite that recites the Quran is like the example of the flower. It has a good smell, but it tastes very bitter. Do you guys get those examples? And so those are amthal that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, hit us with. Allah SWT says in Surah Ibrahim, He says, مثل الذين كفروا بِرَبِّهِمْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ كَرَمَادٍ أَعْمَالُهُمْ كَرَمَادٍ اجتدت به الريح في يوم عاصف so Allah SWT says the example of those who disbelieve in their Lord is like the example of ashes. Their deeds are like ashes and they're being blown in the wind on a very stormy day. And so these people are trying to catch on to these ashes and they're trying to make something of them, but they have no weight to them. And the Prophet Muhammad says that everything will be weighed on the day of judgment and everyone will be weighed. And so we will literally be put onto scales and we will be as heavy as the sincerity and the quality of our good deeds in this world. And so the hypocrites will come on the day of judgment and those who disbelieve in their Lord will come on the day of judgment. And subhanAllah, the thing that I love about Surah Ibrahim is there are consistent patterns in the surah. Consistent patterns. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his blessings upon us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his blessings upon Bani Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his blessings upon trees. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also speaks about gratitude a lot. And the opposite of gratitude in the Quran is disbelief. Have you guys ever noticed that? The opposite, the opposite of gratitude in the Quran is disbelief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, he says, if they are grateful or if they disbelieve, right? لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ In Surah Ibrahim, if you are grateful, I will increase you. And if you dis disbelieve, if you disbelieve, then my punishment is severe. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly throughout the Quran is using this contrast between gratitude and disbelief. But why is this contrast there? Why is the opposite of gratitude disbelief? Why did Allah SWT pair those two up as, as antonyms? And subhanAllah, it's because to, to disbelieve, kafar in, the, in, the, in Arabi comes to, from the word kafara, which means to cover up. 
And so Shaitan Iblis, right after he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and through his dua, he calls Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Rabbi. He says, my Lord, my master, my God. And so Iblis believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes or no? He believed in the oneness of Allah. He believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had might and power over all. Otherwise, he wouldn't call out to him alone. Do you guys get this? Iblis was literally in the presence of Allah. He has no reason to doubt him. And so he says, Rabbi, andrni ila yawmi yubathun. My Lord, my master, allow me respite until the day that you bring us all back. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna kamil al-mundareen, you have been amongst those who have been given time until the day of judgment. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa kana min al-kafireen. And he was amongst those who disbelieved. But it doesn't make sense to me because Iblis believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the thing that Iblis did is he covered up the na'am, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he acted as if they were not there. He victimized himself and he said, Ya Allah, why are you creating this human being who hasn't worshipped you a day in their life and you're making them the khalifa of the earth? You're making them the, the leader of the earth. I am more worthy of that position in your eyes. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated the human beings above the status of the angels and above the status of the jinn. He elevated the human beings. And Iblis was not having it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted Iblis the best position Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ever granted a jinn before. No jinn had the status, had the, had the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon Iblis. No other jinn had his blessings like that. And Iblis chose to cover them up. He chose to, to not recognize them, to be like, no, 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 push all those blessings aside. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose someone over me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave someone a position that I'm more worthy of. Do you guys get this? And so what did Iblis do? He covered up the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thus falling into disbelief. SubhanAllah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, the people come on the day of judgment and they disbelieved in their Lord and they were super ungrateful to their Lord. And so they come with all these good deeds that they put forth, all these, these charities that they put forth to those in need. All of this volunteer work that they put forth um, to the community or to people overseas to, to help humanity. And all of these good deeds that they did, even a smile, it's kind of like I think about this all the time, especially at work when I'm working around non Muslims. They tell me all the time, like, that it's best to make this world better than before you entered it. And so they're like, oh, yeah, like, even a smile goes a long way. I'm like, let me hit you with a hadith right now. Right. And they're like, oh, even holding the door open for someone, even helping a person with their groceries, like giving a person a dollar if they need a car. You know what I mean? And subhanAllah, like they keep mentioning these small acts of goodness. And I'm thinking in my head, Alhamdulillah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is making these acts for us very heavy. Do you guys know what I mean? They're very easy to do for us, as easy as it is to do for them. But for us, we know the weight of them. And we expect the reward with Allah. But for them, they're just like, oh, I just want to see the world good. Do you guys get it? And subhanAllah, I was talking to one of my friends about this last night. SubhanAllah, we were playing like this game. And there was a card that said, if you could be a good atheist, why would religion exist? And I was thinking about it like, subhanAllah, like sure, I could go forth and I could do all of these good deeds. But you get to a certain point where you're like, in bad situations, where in situations where it's easier and more beloved to you to be bad and not to be good. You're like, okay, but what's the point anyway? You know, you're doing all of these good acts, you're donating to the hospitals, you're um, helping people overseas, you're, you're volunteering your time, you're helping children read. You know, SubhanAllah, you're putting forth all of these good actions and then you get to a point and you're like, I'm not even affecting this world anything. You see the injustices happening all over the world and even within our own community. And you're like, what benefit, what impact am I making really? You know, SubhanAllah, and you're like, okay, well, if I'm not making an impact, then what's the point? And so their actions are not heavy anymore. 
You know what I mean? Like, subhanAllah, their actions, like, khalas, they're like, okay, well, these actions hold them away. But for us, even if we don't see a direct impact, we know it's impacting our books, right? We know it's impacting our, our scales on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the full reward of our good deeds. And subhanAllah, so these people come forth on the day of judgment and they had all of these good deeds that they brought forth, but they disbelieved in Allah. And even when they were put in opportunities to do those good deeds, they thought, yeah, I'm, I'm doing something out of the kindness of my heart or I'm doing something because I'm in the upper hand. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sure, he says, yad al-ulya is, is better than the than yad al-sufla. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says that. And there's an ayah similar in Surah An-Nisa. That the, higher, the, the upper hand is better than the lower hand, right? It's better to be in a position to give than to take. But in both their goodness. But subhanAllah, you see when, for example, you see an old person loading up their car with their groceries and they're really struggling and you walk past them and you help them, that person thinks like, oh, I'm so amazing, right? Or like, oh, what a good action I just did. But as Muslims, we think, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set it up perfectly that I left my house at this time, that I went and got my groceries, that I got distracted when I was looking at the chips, took a little bit more time. And then I walked out of the grocery store, saw them struggling to put in their, gro their groceries in their car. At the perfect time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set up this opportunity for me to do good. You guys get it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set up the perfect opportunity for me to do good. As Muslims, we believe that. You guys get it? And so these people come on the day of judgment and they have all of these good deeds. And the Muslims, they are so grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for even having the opportunity to do those good deeds. But for the disbelievers, they disbelieve in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even sent that opportunity to them. Do you guys get it? And so these people come on the day of judgment. They come on the day of judgment and they see their, their deeds in one hadith. A man comes on the day of judgment and he sees mountains and mountains and mountains of good deeds that are his. And he's looking at these mountains and he's thinking, I'm set. Jannah is mine. And then within the blink of an eye, they come crumbling down. And they become like ashes. And then the wind comes and it starts blowing these ashes everywhere. And this man on the day of judgment is coming. And he's trying to catch on, grab hold of these ashes. And he's trying to make something of them, but they have no weight. Can you guys imagine this? This man is running in absolute chaos, trying to grab hold of these ashes that were his good deeds that he put forth. And he exerted all of his energy in the dunya. He put in so much effort in the dunya to make these good deeds amount to something in the akhirah. And he's running after these, these deeds that are now like ashes being blown in the wind. And now a storm comes. Fiyom and Asif. And he's trying to grab hold of the ashes. They won't amount to anything. Those ashes won't amount to anything. He can't form anything with those ashes. They're gone in the wind. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he gives the example of two trees. He says, Alam tara don't you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hit you with an example? He says, kalimatan tayyiba, kashajaratin tayyiba. Asluha thabitu wa faru'uha fissama. He says, the example of a good word is like the example of a good tree. The roots are very deep and very firm and they're holding on to the earth. They're not going to shake. The foundation is solid. Wa faru'uha fissama. And its canopy is in the sky, really, really high in the sky. And subhanAllah, I'm sure you guys have all been to like Banff, Jasper. You guys have been to forests. And as a kid, when I, I remember, I can't remember where we were exactly, but we were passing by forests in the car. And I started looking at them and like, to my parents, it looks like they're competing in the skies in height. Have you guys ever noticed this? It looks like they're climbing up, that they're trying to compete with each other in height. And I was like, why? Why does it look like that? And my mom was like, because they want the sunlight. 
You guys get it? They want the sunlight. They see the light. And so they're trying to compete with each other in height. That right? <laughs> right? SubhanAllah. They're trying to constantly compete to get that light. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about himself? Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. And so we are like good trees. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he was sitting with his companions and he said, can you guys tell me about a tree that is like the believer? And then the companions were sitting down and Abdullah ibn Umar actually, he had the answer, but he was too shy to say it out loud because he had senior companions around him like Abu Bakr and Umar and they were quiet. And so the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he says, the date palm tree. The date palm tree. Subhanallah. The date palm tree, asluha thabit. Its roots are very, very, very firm and they're well rooted within the earth. They're not shaking. Where do we see palm trees? In hot areas, yes. Areas where there's a lot of sun, first of all, correct? So they have that height because of the light. You guys get it? And then also, where are they usually beside? Beaches, exactly. And what happens at beaches? You have waves, you have tsunamis, you have tornadoes. Really, really, really extreme climate. Do you guys get it? SubhanAllah. And these palm trees withstand all of that. Why? Because their foundation is solid. Asluha thabit. Has anyone been beside a palm tree? Anyone? Okay, subhanAllah, last summer I was actually, um, <laughs> I was in Lebanon. I'm not from Lebanon, but I don't know if you guys can tell from my shirt, but <laughs> yeah. So I was in Lebanon and we were walking like by the beach. And there was this huge, 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 really, really tall date palm tree. And I could see the dates as well. And subhanAllah, I'm looking at the tree. I'm like, it's so thin. So you feel like it would fall over and it would waver. But it's the firmest tree I've ever seen in my entire life. And it always looks like they're, about, they're bending. So yeah, subhanAllah. Like always. And on that funny story, I used to think, okay, so you see like how... Um, like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that everything prostrates to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, but we don't understand their prostration. Or like everything, like everything praises Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, everything in the heavens and the earth, but you guys don't understand their praises. Even Yunus Alayhi Salam, what woke him up in the belly of the whale is when the whale hit the bottom of the ocean, he heard the rocks praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the bottom of the ocean. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. And so I used to think like, okay, the trees are bowing down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know that some bend, right? So like, but they only do it when I'm not looking. So I have to catch them off guard. <laughs> so I'd like try to like catch a quick look. I'm like, oh, that one's bent. That means it was halfway in, in, in Rukua. But I just, I couldn't get it fast enough, right? But I was wrong. They bow down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sure, but just in a way that we don't understand. And so the example of the good tree is like, or the example of the good word is like a good tree. And then he says, It gives its fruits, it gives its benefit all year round by the permission of its Lord. What does this mean? A date palm tree is, is a tree that's of season. Do you know what I mean? It only gives fruit once or twice a year. So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about here? SubhanAllah, the dates, when they're ripe or before they're ripe, you could eat them as well. Has anyone had like unripe dates? They're like yellow. They're hard. Sorry? Is it called banana? I have no idea what it's called in Arabic. <laughs> but it's like, it makes your mouth so dry. Yeah. It has like a very mild flavor. It's a little bit sweet, but it makes your mouth so dry. It's like eating an unripe banana. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And so anyway, when it's not, that's that's when it's in season. When it's not in season, what do we do th to them? We dry them out. We could have dates all year round. All year round. That, that's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is constantly eating dates. Right? 
Um, not sure what my battery is for. This is a thing. And then if we look at the date palm tree as well, it has really, really big leaves. And what did the Prophet Muhammad and his companions use this for? You guys know the message movie? When they were building the masjid, what did they use for the roof? The leaves, subhanAllah. They use these leaves as shelter. And then the tree itself has sap. The tree itself has, has sweet sap. SubhanAllah. And then even the bark of the tree, you could burn and you could use for extracts or you could burn and use for, for fuel, for fire. And then the leaves of the trees as well, you could dry them out, crush them up, and then make them into a paste for medicine. And then the date seed, you could use that for medicine as well. And you could even make coffee out of it. Right, caffeine. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So subhanAllah, literally, it's so versatile. All year round, it's giving its benefit by the permission of its Lord. And then we get to the flip side. And the example of a bad evil word is like a bad evil tree. Uh, it's like a bad evil tree. It's just sitting on top of the earth and it doesn't have any dwelling place. Like it doesn't have deep roots like the like the kanimatin tayyiba, like the, the good word, the good tree. It has no firm roots, and so wind can literally just come and blow it away. And it doesn't have any dwelling place because it's constantly being moved around. Do you guys get it? SubhanAllah. And now we get to the ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have you not looked at the people? Have you not seen the people? who changed the na'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who changed the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and made them into disbelief. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about here? The blessings. People took blessings from Allah and they switched it and changed it into disbelief. We'll break this down. He says, um, And they made halal for them. They made it their right to be in the home of destruction. Jahannam is going to surround them. Jahannam is going to, to torment them. And what a terrible place of dwelling. You see those trees? Those trees that had no, no, no place to rest, no, no dwelling, no place to stay. Now they have a qarar. Now they have a place to stay in Jahannam. Do you guys get this? Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, have you not seen the people who take the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a good thing, and they switch it into disbelief? And every tafsir book that I've, I've looked at during my research, they were talking about the people of Mecca. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being the biggest blessing ever. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was literally in their presence. And they flipped that, that blessing of Allah, and they turned it into disbelief. They disbelieved in the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were ungrateful for the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ exerting all of his energy to try and, and lead them to guidance, to take them out of darkness and into light, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the very beginning of the surah. to take them out of darkness and into light. And so they disbelieved in the blessing that was the Prophet Muhammad Do you guys get this? And then I was thinking about it as well. And SubhanAllah, we do this a lot as well. Like straight up to, to put it like very, very frankly, 
we do this a lot as well. We focus on the negatives and then we ignore the positives. We push them aside because we don't feel like they're, they're, they're that big. Do you guys know what I mean? And the, the greatest level that you could get in your ingratitude, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, but the greatest stage that a person gets in their ingratitude is something called kafar. Kafar. If the word lengthens, then the meaning of the word intensifies. So not kafar anymore, but kafar. Kafar means to be super, super ungrateful and disobedient to the point where it leads you to disbelief. But it's to a point, an extent that you get to, where you don't see any good in a situation and you only see the bad. So like, for example, it's, for example, when a husband and wife are arguing and they use words like never and always, like you always do that. You've never once helped me in this. Do you guys get it? Yeah. I'm not married, so I can't give marriage advice. But, <laughs> but for example, like you never ever take out the garbage when I ask you to. He's like, what do you mean? Like I did it last month. Okay, last month was a long time. Like granted, justified, right? But to say never is to be, is to disbelieve in the fact that he did it before. Do you guys get it? To disbelieve in that blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you through him taking out the trash last month. Do you guys get it? Yeah. Okay, so subhanAllah, and I'm someone who's very guilty of this. That, or I used to be very guilty of this. I used to focus on the negatives and then overlook the positives in a situation. And the thing about Islam, the thing about Islam is there's good in absolutely every bad thing. Every bad thing. Even in the haram, there's good in the haram. You guys are like, what are you talking about, Ayan? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even mentions this himself. It's one thing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recognize this. And of course, I know that he recognizes this because he has all the knowledge and all the wisdom. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about alcohol, what does he say? What does he say about alcohol? In it is some benefit for the people. But there's a lot of harm. Do you guys get it? In it is some benefit, but there's a lot of harm. And the harm outweighs the benefit, so it's better for you to stay away from it. Do you guys get it? Yeah, subhanAllah. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that there's good in the haram. Do you guys get this, subhanAllah? But the bad outweighs the good. In any bad situation, I guarantee it. There's good in it. SubhanAllah, I was, I was trying to think about like a hardship that I was in. And the only thing that could like come to mind was, for example, being in school. I was in a condensed program and it was very like, um, just very, very stressful. I was doing two years and six months. Super, super stressful. And so SubhanAllah, I was in hardship at that time. But once I came out of that hardship, you know what I was thinking about? all the blessings that I left behind in that hardship. Because Penelope, when I was in school and I was studying, I would go to the mall on my break and then I would read Quran there. And I have never reflected on Quran the way that I reflected on Quran during that time. So I left that hardship, but I also left that blessing behind. In that, in that situation, while I was in that hardship, did I realize that blessing? I was just like, no, this is so cool, right? Like, whoa, this reflection is sick. This, this surah is hitting different. But did I recognize that in the time, I was focused on the hardship? Do you guys get it? SubhanAllah. And so with every, every hardship, there's goodness in it. But a person who is super ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they overlook the good and the bad. Do you guys get it? And you guys could think about your own, your own hardships right now. I want you guys to take a second. Think about a hardship that you're either experiencing right now or a hardship that you experienced before. And then raise your hand when you have one. I won't ask you guys about it, but <laughs> just raise your hand when you guys have it. If it's like a health problem, 
a financial problem, school, family, relationship, work, siblings. <laughs> Raise your hand when you have a hardship. You got one? Allah's not testing you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now think about all the good that you're either experiencing in this hardship or all the good that you experienced in the hardship if it was something past. And notice that this good only came when this hardship came as well. Do you guys recognize that? Like actually... Don't, don't just give me nods because you guys are like, I need this chick to stop right now. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? It says, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى When we translate this, we, we say that indeed after hardship comes ease. Correct? But what does ma' mean? With. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is literally promising us that every time I give you hardship, don't worry, I'm going to pack some ease with it too. Ease will not be separated from hardship. When I send you hardship, know that I'm going to send you more ease that you've never experienced before. And so if we think as we're in that hardship, that yo, this is only hardship, that there's nothing good that can come out of this, that there's nothing good in this for me, then we're not only being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings that we're overlooking, but we're disbelieving in the promise of Allah. Do you guys get this? We are disbelieving in the very promise of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a promise on top of that promise, in Allah la yukhliful mi'ad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not forsake his promise. Know that when Allah promises something, he's going to follow through. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I package ease with every hardship that I sent you, with every bad thing that I send you, know that there's good in it. And we don't see that good or we don't recognize it or we see like a trickle of a thought of, yo, maybe there's goodness in this for me. Or hey, what about this? For example, if you're going to work and you absolutely hate your job and you're like, this is hardship upon hardship upon hardship. Let's see, you're not even getting paid. Okay. Cause a paycheck is going to be the good in it. Right. But let's say you're not getting paid. You're being oppressed in your job and a person walks in and they give you a donut. You're like, what's this donut going to do for me? Do you know what I mean? Like sure. Simple, dumb example. But subhanAllah, you overlook the blessing of that person giving you a donut. Do you guys get it? You choose not to recognize that even though it's right in front of your face. It's right in front of your face. And so we're not only being ungrateful to Allah, but we're disbelieving in his promise. And that's how we fall into disbelief. Do you guys get it? That's how we fall into disbelief. And then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, why aren't you granting me better? Ya Allah, why aren't you relieving me of this hardship? Ya Allah, why aren't you helping me with this difficulty? And what does Allah say a few ayat before? rabbukum. And when your Lord announced, when he declared, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ if you are grateful, I will increase you. You guys, all of our answers are found in the promises of Allah. All of our answers are found in the promises of Allah. The answer is gratitude. If we're going through these hardships and we feel like everything is just getting worse and worse and worse, we need to recognize within ourselves there are blessings in this hardship that I am overlooking. And that's why it's getting worse for me because I'm not recognizing them and I'm not being grateful to Allah for them. Do you guys get it? Like, actually, I don't know if I'm getting, getting like too deep and philosophical, but do you guys understand it? Okay, so if we look at the example of the evil tree, I'm thinking there's good in everything, correct? If Allah is telling me that there's good in alcohol, Although the harm outweighs the, the good. 
then there has to be good in everything. There's good in every bad thing. And so I'm thinking, what's the good of the evil tree? First of all, why is the evil tree evil to begin with? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anzala min as ma and rizqan lakum, if it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent down rain, who sent down water from the skies to, to be a sustenance for us and for, for the plants of the earth and, and the an'am and the animals of the earth. If these trees are getting the same rain that the good trees are getting, why are they not taking it up? Why are their roots not taking it up? Their foundation is weak and so their roots are deep enough within the earth. But let's say the water is touching the earth and touching the roots specifically. It's because these trees are choosing not to recognize the water. Do you guys get this? I'm getting very metaphorical. Yeah. <laughs> these trees are choosing not to recognize the water or maybe they're ungrateful for the water to begin with. They're like, oh no, this water is like room temperature. I prefer colder water. Do you guys get it? All these nutrients in the soil, no, I'm not about them. I want different minerals and, and vitamins. Do you guys get this? And then even the sunlight, they're choosing not to recognize the sunlight and they're like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't need it. And what happens when they think they don't need it? They wither away. They die. They, they, stay, they stay at their height. They never flourish to their potential. Because the evil tree has the potential to be like the good tree. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the good tree. Because what's anything without potential? Do you guys get it? And so what's the good in the evil tree if it's being this ungrateful? And I'm thinking, okay, the, the fruit is evil because it's an evil tree. If it's not taking in nutrients, the fruit is going to be like very wilted. Okay, the trees are evil. They're going to be wilted as well. I can't use them for for shelter i can't use them for medicine okay the bark is going to be like super brittle it's it's not going to be usable for for anything like medicine or or like to clean your teeth or anything do you guys get what i mean and so what's the benefit in the evil tree can you guys rationalize with me um i Yes, along the lines of that. That's a good answer. What do you do with an evil tree? With a tree that has... Take the wood. Sorry? Take the wood. For what? Like For what, sorry? Paper and stuff like that. So when the, when the wood is that brittle, oh. you can't even use it for paper. You can't use it for anything useful. So what do you use it for? You can just make a fire. So what does that word become? Fuel for a fire. Okay, get this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, He says to the people who are claiming that they can make words like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, that they can bring forth words like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, we don't believe that the words are made, that Allah's words are made, but we just believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them down. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ if you guys think that you're able to, to produce words, to, to bring forth words like mine, then call upon your witnesses other than Allah if you guys are in fact truthful. And then he says, And if you can't and you won't, he says, He says, Then fear the fire of which the fuel of the fire is people and stones. Do you guys get where I'm going? So what's the example of an evil person? The example of the evil tree. What good is it? What benefit does the evil tree have for us? What good do we find in the evil tree? The only thing we can do with it is burn it and use it for fuel. Do you guys get it? That's our only option. That's the only option it left for us. It's to burn it and use it for fuel for fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful, you guys, that the only time he will punish a person is when that's his last option. Do you guys get it? 
when khalas mercy is, is not even in question anymore. It's out of the window. A person who is the fuel of the fire of Jahannam understand all of the blessings that they overlooked, understand all of the chances that they lost. All of the chances that all the opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them one after the other. And they acted like they weren't there, like, no, nah, no, nah, I can't see them. Do you guys get it? The only option they left for Allah is to do what? What good are they now? Just fuel for the fire. Do you guys get it? Yeah? Do you guys actually get it? Yeah. Like, subhanAllah. Or are you guys just like shocked? But subhanAllah, that's the only good and evil person at that point. On the day of judgment, that's their only use. Just to fuel the fire of Jahannam. Like, could you guys imagine, subhanAllah? Like, subhanAllah, that's worse than being useless. Do you know what I mean? SubhanAllah. Okay, and now I'm thinking because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, Surah Ibrahim is a surah with a lot of patterns. Lots and lots of patterns. In the beginning of Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Musa alayhi salam and the Jews. And, and the Jews. And he says, Ya Bani Israel, azkuru na'matullahi alaykum. O children of Israel, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings upon you. In anjakum, when he saved you, min ali fir'aun, from, from Fir'aun and his army and his people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yasumunakum su al adab. When they were afflicting you with torment and punishment, Yudabbihuna abna'akum wa yastahyuna nisa'akum. They used to kill off your men, they used to kill off your sons, and they used to leave your women. What does that mean, leave your women? To keep them alive for what? To do horrible things to them. Do you guys get it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I saved you from that. Remember my blessing upon you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent so many blessings to Bani Israel. They had prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly in the Quran, Ifkuru na'matullahi alaykum. Ya Bani Israel, Ifkuru na'matullah. Wa dhakkiruhum bi ayyamillah. And remind them of the of the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The days of Allah are days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala split the sea for them. وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ وَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ Right? وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْذُرُونَ And remember my blessing upon you in, in Surah Al-Baqarah. Remember my blessing upon you when we split the sea for you and we saved you from Fir'aun and his army and you guys and we drowned Fir'aun and his army and you were watching this take place. You watched it go down yourself. Do you guys get this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly is reminding them, remember my blessings upon you. Remember my grace upon you. Remember my favors upon you. And the thing that gets me about Bani Israel is their ingratitude. Is their ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his blessings. We look at something like the Sabbath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, listen, you guys can fish all throughout the week, but on Saturdays, those are my days. Don't cast your nets in the ocean. No fishing on Saturdays. Leave your work on Saturday and just worship me on that day. And what did the Jews do? They're like, okay, let's put our nets out on Friday and then we'll pick them up on Sunday. So are they getting the fruit of Saturday? They're getting the, the fish of Saturday, yeah? And so that's what they did. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, I asked you for one day. You know what? what's so crazy to me, subhanAllah? Okay, I'm going to give you guys like a really, really dumb example. But whenever I eat, I'm very mindful. Like if I'm eating chips, I'll make sure that I'm eating odd numbers. And if I forget what I'm like, what number I'm on, I'm like, okay, hey, I'm done. Cause like at that point, I'm not, I'm no longer being mindful. Do you guys get it? Weird example. But okay, so this energy drink, caffeine doesn't affect me. <laughs> I don't know why, subhanAllah, but it just it doesn't affect me at all. I will literally wake up at 5 a.m., drink a coffee, and then go to sleep at 7 a.m. Like just right away. 
So like, subhanAllah, it just does not affect me. One day at work last week, I was so tired of the week before. I was so tired, you guys. Like falling asleep over patience, like holding whatever materials and I'm falling asleep. And I was like, okay, let's, let me go and grab an energy drink. So I grabbed an energy drink and I went to some horn to like get some bread so that it's not only the energy drink in my stomach, right? And one lady like in front of me, she was taking so long in the lineup and she was like going back and forth to her kids at the table, like asking, oh, they don't have croissants. Like, what do you want? Right. And I'm, I'm thinking, okay, like I need to drink my drink, but I want to sit down when I'm drinking it because the Prophet Muhammad told me that that's better for me. Do you guys get it? And so I'm like, okay, but she's taking so long. My lunch break is 30 minutes. I have like 20 minutes left. How am I going to finish this energy drink and eat? So I'm like, okay, like I really need to drink this. But I was like, you know what, Ayan, stop. Because caffeine doesn't even work for you. <laughs> but what if the fact that you sat down while drinking it, because you know that was beloved to the Prophet, what if Allah SWT puts barakah in that for that reason and the caffeine actually works for you? Do you guys get what I mean? And so when I think of the Sabbath and I think of Bani Israel, I'm like, they literally changed the blessing of Allah SWT into disbelief because they were ungrateful i'm thinking yo if i was a jew in that time i'd be like chilling i don't have to work and allah SWT is going to provide for me i know that if i don't work on saturday allah SWT is going to give me even more on the other days because of the barakah of following the command of allah do you guys get what i mean because of the barakah of doing that which is beloved to allah SWT, chilling i don't need to work on saturday Right? Allah SWT got me. It's not like my risk is running away from me anyway. And especially if I'm, I'm fulfilling the command of Allah, I'm doing something beloved to Allah SWT, I'm pleasing to Allah in that moment. I know that even if my risk um, is the same as it always was written before I was even born, I know that Allah SWT is going to put barakah in that risk for me. I'm going to see it in abundance even if it's the same amount. Do you guys get what I mean? SubhanAllah. And so like it boggles my mind, it blows my mind that Bani Israel were literally like, oh, I can't work. Like, and I'm a person who loves to work, by the way. Like I'm a workaholic. But they're like, oh, I can't work. SubhanAllah. Let me, let me kind of like play a trick. Let me hack the system, finesse the system. Let me put my net on Friday, pick it up on Sunday so that I could still get the work day of Saturday. Allah SWT is like, I asked you for one day. And I said, I'm the provider. I'm the one who sends down your risk anyway. It's not you. Do you guys get it? They literally took something good. And they were so ungrateful for that good thing. The fact that Allah SWT said, just worship me on Saturday. Don't worry about your risk. I handle it. I got you. And they changed it into into disbelief because of their ingratitude. Because it's like they disbelieved in the fact that Allah SWT was, was the one who sends down rizq. Do you know what I mean? That Allah SWT is a razaq They disbelieved in Allah SWT's name, a razaq Do you guys get what I mean, subhanAllah? It's crazy. When Musa alayhi salam, another example in Bani Israel, when Musa alayhi salam was called to Allah SWT, Allah SWT is like, yo Musa, I gotta meet with you real quick. Come to me for 30 days. And he was fasting. Musa alayhi salam was like, yo, I can't meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with bad breath. Right? I can't meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with bad breath. Let me chew on some bark just so that I can freshen my breath before Allah. Do you know what I mean? And so Musa alayhi salam comes before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, yeah, Musa, why did you do that if you're fasting? So you know that the, that the breath of the fasting person is most beloved to me? And Musa was like, Ya Allah, I didn't have the, the heart to meet you with bad breath. Right? SubhanAllah. And then Allah SWT says, Ya Musa, I'm going to keep you 10 more days. Musa salam's people were with Harun salam, another prophet of Allah. And this prophet was only a prophet because Allah SWT blessed Musa salam by making him a prophet. And blessed Bani Israel. Harun was literally the definition of a blessing. Do you guys get what I mean? The definition of a blessing. They not only had one prophet, but they had two amongst them. And when Allah SWT was taking Musa to meet with him, 
so that he could give him the, the breakdown of, okay, listen, this is what I'm going to do for Bani Israel. This is what I'm going to do for you and your people. Musa alayhi salam was going to Allah to get more blessings. He took 10 extra days. Harun was with them. They gathered all of their jewelry. They melted it. And they sculpted a cow. The statue of a cow. And they began to worship it. Harun was amongst them. And they began to worship it. And Harun alayhi salam is like trying to convince them not to like, what are you guys doing? Like your prophet is gone for 10 extra days. I'm here as well. How are you guys disbelieving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after all the blessings that he bestowed upon you? They changed the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into disbelief. Do you know what I mean, subhanAllah? And Musa alayhi salam comes back, guns blazing, grabs his brother. <laughs> subhanAllah, and he's like, why did you let them disbelieve? Like, why did you allow them to do this? And like, subhanAllah, to me, like the... The part in the Quran that I feel like the most bad for someone is this moment when Harun is like, Yab no ummi, like, oh, son of my mother, like, please just don't, don't blame me for this. And Musa is literally holding him, like, with his beard. <laughs> Musa is was a strong guy. He accidentally punched someone and killed him. <laughs> like, imagine his force, subhanAllah. We think of Musa as someone who, who was very shy in front of Allah, someone who had a lot of fears inside of him. Broski was tough. He punched the angel of death and took out his eye. <laughs> like you, have you guys heard that story? No? The angel of death came to Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam got scared. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing here? He punches him in the face. Literally takes out the eye of the angel of death. And the angel of death goes up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holding his eye. He's like, yeah, Allah, Musa punched me. <laughs> right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repaired his eye. He's like, go back, go back. <laughs> Like, imagine, subhanAllah. And then Musa alayhi salam calmed down. His people literally switched the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into disbelief. It's crazy. And the people of Mecca not only did this with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, but they did this with Mecca itself. The house that Ibrahim alayhi salam built. They had peace within their, within their city. Ibrahim alayhi salam will get to the ayat in a bit. Ya Allah, make this, this city safe and peaceful. The haram, even till now, we're not allowed to fight in it. Did you guys know that? We're not allowed to fight in it. Mecca had a huge advantage. The Quraysh, the reason why they were so powerful, they didn't have, like, Mecca really didn't have gold. It didn't have, like, crazy warfare. Mecca didn't have anything but poetry. Poetry in the Kaaba. But people would come from long and far to come worship the idols at the Kaaba. And so they had peace treaties with every tribe surrounding in the Arabian Peninsula and beyond. Do you guys get, you guys get it? No one would go to war with the Quraysh because of the Kaaba. No one would, would try to fight the Quraysh, would try to go against the Quraysh because of the Kaaba. Do you guys get it? They took this blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Kaaba, and they literally turned it into disbelief. They turned the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into disbelief. You guys get it? To continue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا لِيُضِلُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ قُلْ تَمَتَّعُوا فَإِنَّ مَصِيرَكُمْ إِلَى النَّارِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they, and they made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala andad, partners with Allah. Partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but when andad is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, uh, andada, do you not see the people who take besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dad partners? They love them as, as they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's not only that they have these, these idols that they're worshipping, but they have these idols that they love and that they love to worship. 
يحبونهم كحب الله they love them like they should love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala والذين آمنوا أشد حبا لله but those who believe they are more intense they're more firm in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so the Quraysh they set up these partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ليذلوا عن سبيله so that they might divert people away from his path and the Quraysh didn't believe in these idols themselves the, the actual OG leaders of the Quraysh, they were just like, okay, let's make a quick buck. Do you guys get what I mean? Let's make sure that the people are under our command. Let's make sure that the people are obedient to us because we're the keepers of the Kaaba. Do you guys get it? They didn't really care about the idols themselves. But لِيُدِلُّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ So that they could lead others astray and so that they could make themselves higher up in position. Do you guys get it? So they could have power over the people. لِيُدِلُّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ Allah SWT says, قُلْ تَمَتَّعُوا فَإِنَّ مَصِيرَكُمْ إِلَى النَّارِ He says, yeah, yeah, go ahead and play. Go, to, go ahead and be deceived. For indeed, your, your abode, your final resting place is to the fire. And then Allah SWT says, قُلْ لِعِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, say to my servants, um, those who believe, to establish their prayers and to give and to distribute of what Allah SWT has, has provided for them as sustenance. Sirra wa alaniya. In secret and in public. Do you guys get it? You know, a lot of people like the Munafiqun in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Munafiqun, like the hypocrites in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For example, in the Battle of Tabuk, this battle was a really, really, really tough, difficult battle for the Muslims. And so, during the Battle of Tabuk, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he he stood at the member and he said, "Who will fund Jesh al Asra? Who will fund the army of hardship?" And a lot of people were coming forth and they were like, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'm going to fund half of the army's gear. Umar radiallahu anhu comes, he's like, Ya Rasulullah, here's half of my wealth. Abu Bakr comes, he's like, Ya Rasulullah, here's everything I own. Uthman radiallahu anhu comes and he donates in abundance. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, nothing will harm Uthman after today. Crazy, crazy. And then there were people who had absolutely nothing to give except dates, literally dates. And the Munafiqun were sitting in the masjid and they're laughing. They're like, <laughs> like, what are these people doing giving dates? Like, what, what good is that going to do? And then they saw Uthman and Abu Bakr and Umar giving them large amounts. They're like, oh, look at these show-offs. They're just doing it so people could praise them. Do you guys get it? There are times where you're supposed to give alaniya where you're supposed to give in public. For example, has anyone been to like auctions and like charity iftars? Yeah. And people are like, okay, we'll start off small. Who's going to donate 100,000? Right? <laughs> 100,000, 100,000. And you see like the businessmen like raising up their hands. Yeah. SubhanAllah. I think I, I was at one fundraiser. I think seven businessmen donated $100,000. Like crazy, crazy amounts, subhanAllah. And guess what I heard? People saying, oh, they're just doing it to show off. Right, subhanAllah. But subhanAllah, that's what the companions experienced as well. And then there are people who literally come with whatever they have to give and they're donating it. And then the munafiqun again say like, what good is this going to do to the army? An army of 10,000 men, what, what are two dates going to do? Who's, who's that going to feed? You know what I mean, subhanAllah? And so, bottom line, no one will be happy. No one will be happy with your good deeds because they don't understand the whispers of your heart. They don't understand what your heart is inclined towards. Pardon me, is that a hand slice of the blood? Like, the person that donated, like, the two dates might have, like, a bigger cost amount compared to the person that had, like, the money mm -hmm. because, like, they gave when they were like have started. Exactly, exactly. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. 
and that like goes back to what we were saying in the beginning too about um the weight of our good deeds right subhanallah literally like uh we know the story of a prostitute who fed water to a dog Right, sorry. <laughs> who fed water to a dog. And because of that, she was granted Jannah. Right? SubhanAllah. <laughs> nothing, nothing. <laughs> right, SubhanAllah. She was granted Jannah because of that. A man walked on the road, saw a branch that could be annoying to a Muslim, so he moved it aside. The Prophet said, I saw him walking in Jannah. <laughs> SubhanAllah, because of that good deed, Subhanallah, we don't know the extent of our good deeds. And then the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, also teaches us to give in secret to the point where our right hand doesn't know what our left hand gave. And our left hand doesn't know what our right hand gave. Do you guys know what I mean? And I want you guys to try this as well. Like it's it's so secret, you're hiding it from everyone in your family, you're hiding it from everyone in the community, you're even hiding it from yourself as well. Okay. I want you guys to try this. I know like not a lot of people carry cash or whatever. But if you guys do carry cash, next time you guys come to the masjid, have like a few different types of bills in your purse. Like maybe like five, 10, uh, 20, 50, $100. And then just like pick randomly. Don't even look in your purse. Put it in the box without even looking at it. And then go home and just like mess up all the money so you don't know what you gave. Do you guys know what I mean? That's how you give with your left hand, not knowing what your right hand gave. Do you guys get it? Let's say, okay, it's digital. Like the masjid in Ramadan has like those huge digital tablets where you could give. Just like, go, <laughs> you know, press random buttons. Don't know what you're doing. And then just tap. And you'll see like the balance on your credit card bill after. But <laughs> Right? SubhanAllah. <laughs> but try not to pay attention to it. Like SubhanAllah, really, 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 when you're giving in secret, make sure it's a secret. Make sure it's even a secret from yourself. And you're thinking like, whoa, that's impossible. Allah SWT makes it possible. Like straight up. Allah SWT makes it possible. Because at the end of the day, it's not even you giving. It's you distributing what Allah SWT gave you. It's you investing in your akhirah. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, one day he had like sacrificed an animal. And the Prophet Muhammad said to Aisha, okay, cook it and give it away. Give away the meat. Cut it up and give away the meat. And so the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, his favorite piece of the animal was the shoulder. I think it was a sheep. It was the shoulder. The shoulder doesn't really have a lot of meat, by the way. But that was his favorite piece of the, of the animal. And so he comes home and he's like, yeah, Aisha. He's like, okay, what did, what did you give away? And she says, Ya Rasulullah, Nothing remains except the shoulder. I gave all of it away to the poor except the shoulder. So nothing remains except the shoulder. And the Prophet ﷺ got upset. And he's like, yeah, Aisha, everything remains except the shoulder. The only thing that we won't see is the shoulder now, even though it's right in front of us. Because everything else was an investment in our akhirah except the shoulder. Do you guys get it? Because at the end of the day, we're going to eat it here and we're not going to see it anymore. Do you guys get that, subhanAllah? And so like, subhanAllah, that's, that's really giving in a way that's introspective. That you know when you're unfiqing, <laughs> right? When yunfiqu mimma razaqnakum, when you're giving up, when you're distributing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, you're not giving it up and you're not going to see it again. You're investing in your akhirah. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she used to give her, her zakat or her sadaqah, she used to spray perfume on it. Did you guys know this? She used to spray perfume on it. And then sometime, oh, like one time someone asked her, they're like, why are you spraying perfume? She's like, because I'm giving it to Allah. And I want it to smell nice when he gets it. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Like I was doing this once um, in the car, like really, really quickly. I think it was Ramadan or something. Um, so I like grabbed perfume and I sprayed it really quickly. And my sister's like, are you wearing perfume? Because like I'm I'm really firm on not wearing perfume. <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? She's like, tap it. <laughs> she didn't say that, but it's like, what? 
subhanAllah. And like, subhanAllah, this also like really tangent stretch, but this goes back to being a stranger. You know what I mean? Like the Sahaba who were giving a hundred thousand camels for the sake of Allah subhanAllah, they were strangers. The hypocrites were like, what? Show offs. The people who are coming and giving dates, they were strangers. They're like, what? Show offs as well. There are certain companions who are even strangers amongst the strangers. Like Abu Dar, like no one understood the guy. <laughs> you guys know what I mean? SubhanAllah. Okay, let me continue. Oh, I don't think we'll get to Ibrahim Ali Salam's dads today, but. Hmm. Yeah, so tell them to establish prayer and to give up from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for them. Sirra wa alaniya min qabli ay yatiya yawmun la bay'un fihi wa la khilal. And allow them to give up what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided for them um, in a way that's in secret and in public. And notice also the scholars always point out, notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first said sirra before he said alaniya. First he said to give up that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided you in private and then do it in public. Do you guys get it? And subhanAllah, when I first got into da'wah and I first got into like community involvement and volunteering, I really, really, really struggled with the fact that most of my good deeds were public. I like you see that that um nasheed, Yeah, Yeah. That hadith, uh, sorry, that nasheed, it was a great nasheed, loved it. It scared the crap out of me. I couldn't listen to it without crying. Because I was like, I, I have no secrets with Allah. Like at this point, the only secrets I have are my sins. <laughs> right? Like I have no good secrets with Allah. بَيْنَكَ أَنْتَ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ هَلْ لَكَ صَدَقَاتٌ تَخْفَى لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ Do you have any, any sadaqa that's private? that no one knows about except you and Allah. And you know what else I struggled with really like hard about sadaqah specifically? Is anytime I was donating to an Islamic organization, the admin knew me. You know what I mean? Like they knew like, okay, Rayan donated this amount on this day. You guys know what I mean? So it really, really messed with my head because I'm like, okay, even if I try to be private in my sadaqah, they know it's from me. You guys know what I mean, subhanAllah? Like what, what private, actually private good deeds do I have with Allah? I really, really, really struggled with this. And so I saw advice from someone and I was told to make sure that my private good deeds outweigh my public good deeds. You can still do the public good deeds, still volunteer within the community, still go to halakot, still give halakot, still um, like be on boards or whatever, do whatever you 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 do normally publicly but make sure that you also have your private good deeds and make sure that they're they're extra that they're more and i can't remember which scholar it was i think it was either ibn al-qaim or ibn taymiyyah um but then i'm getting, i'm not entirely sure they say that i don't rely on my public deeds and these are scholars you guys they say i don't rely on my public deeds I rely on my private deeds and my public deeds are my insurance. If they amount to anything on the day of judgment, it's sick. But I'm not relying on them. Because there are so many different factors like riya, so many different factors like um, my intentions not being the purest or my intentions being pure at the very beginning and then switching. Do you know what I mean? SubhanAllah, there are so many things that could go wrong with my public good deeds. So I don't even think about them. Do you guys get it? SubhanAllah. Um, yeah, min qabli ayyatiya yawmun la bay'un fihi wa la khilal. Do all of this stuff before a day comes where there is no bay', there, there's no sales, and there's no khilal, there's no intimate friendships anymore. People will come on the day of judgment and they'll literally bite their hands and they'll say, Ya laytani lam qalila. Like, oh, I'm so dumb. I wish I didn't take this person as my intimate close friend. The Prophet says, You are on the deen of Khalilik or Khalilat. 
you are on the deen, on the religion of your intimate close friend. This is Surah Ibrahim. Allah SWT says, وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا Allah SWT has taken Ibrahim as his Khalil. Khalil is a huge term, you guys. Allah SWT says, the people that were closest to you in this world. That's the closest status you could reach with another person. It's khulla. It's, it's this close, intimate bond. And it's very exclusive. The Prophet says, if I could choose one khalil of my ummah, it would be Abu Bakr. But I can't because Allah already chose me to be his khalil, and so I can't choose someone else. Do you guys get it? And Abu Bakr is Abu Bakr. You know what I mean? Subhanallah. And so the, Allah SWT is saying, on this day, forget about all your friendships. You guys are going to be running away from each other. La bay'an fihi wa la khilal. You guys can't purchase anything. And so the scholars say, I think it was um, Tafsir al-Sa'di, like Imam al-Sa'di. He says, even if you're able to bring all of the treasures of this world and present them before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as ransom so that you're not punished, even if you were able to do that, it wouldn't matter. Because la bay'an fihi. It's not going to benefit you. You can't, you can't make any trades on this day. You get what I mean? And then wala khilal. The scholars also say, I think in Ibn Kathir, it says that in this dunya, a lot of times we choose our friends based on what they can do for us. Right? That's like sometimes what it comes down to. Based on what they can do for us. And whether that's in the material or just emotional support or um, just having someone to hang out with. You know what I mean? We choose people like that. And a lot of times in this world, when we're about to get in trouble or we're about to fall into a sticky situation, we're like, no, nah, no, nah, I got connections. You know what I mean? You call up your, your sisters, friends, uncles, nieces, dogs, neighbor, right? Yeah, I got connections, <laughs> right? SubhanAllah. And you get, that's their ransom. That's your ransom, right? You get out of a sticky situation because of the people that you know. Right, everyone says like expand your network because you never know who you'll need. You know what I mean, SubhanAllah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says like, nah, that doesn't matter to me on this day. Or you guys can't do that with me. SubhanAllah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, make sure that you guys are good, establish your prayers and distribute what I provided for you before that day comes when nothing else matters. And he says, Allah It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created the heavens and the earth. And he allowed from, or he sent down from the skies water. And then he made from that water, akhraja. Like he, he allowed to sprout forth from all types of fruits and, and benefits and goodness, rizqan lakum as a sustenance for you. And he allowed the boat to float in the ocean by his permission for you guys. SubhanAllah, you think about the boat floating in the ocean. So many things can go wrong. And this is actually why the companions were so afraid of the ocean too. Like in the time of Amr radiallahu anhu, the companions kept on telling him like, make a navy, make a navy. Like we're the most powerful army in the world and we don't have a navy. We don't have like a established force like to go on the sea, to travel. We could conquer so many other countries and so many other places through the ocean. If we had that resource, if we had that outlet. Amr radiallahu anhu is like, nah, I'm not taking this chance. We're, we're from the desert, buddy, right? We don't know water, we know sand. Right? I could get you more camels, but like no chance am I getting you a boat. Right? Like subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's saying, I am the one who allowed the boat to float in the ocean. And boats, like, if you actually think about it, what makes what keeps them afloat? SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah, I was actually in my tafsir class and my teacher was talking about this this morning. He's like, you see when you're skipping rocks? Can you guys skip rocks, by the way? I was never able to do it. Okay, like skipping rocks on the water. Even if you get like, it's a skip like one, two, three, four, whatever. Ultimately, it'll fall in the ocean at the very end. 
or like in the water. You know what I mean? It'll sink. SubhanAllah. It'll sink. A person who's in the water, if they're not resisting the, the water, what are they going to do? They're going to drown. They're going to sink. Anything eventually will sink. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, look at my blessing upon you guys, that I allow the, the boat to float in the ocean. You know what else this reminds me of? Airplanes. Right? Airplanes. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the plane to be in the sky like the birds. Unheard of. You know what I mean, subhanAllah? And if you look at planes, so much can go wrong. Is anyone traveling soon? Okay, so much can go wrong. The engine can stop working. <laughs> right? One of the wings can fall off. Like right? the navigation can, can lose connection. The pilot can die mid-flight. Right? Someone can be crazy and start smashing a window and the entire thing goes down. Right? Someone can be like, oh, I'm gonna go to the wash and they open the exit door. You guys are done. Right? Like so many things can go wrong. You guys can run out of fuel. You're like, oh, shoot, I grabbed the water can instead of the fuel, right? Like, I don't know. So many things can go wrong, subhanAllah. Even when you guys are landing, did you know that it's more dangerous for a plane to be on, on the land than it is to be in the sky? That's scary. SubhanAllah. <laughs> when it's landing, because of how fast it's going, have you guys even, like ever seen when a plane is landing, how the wheel catches on fire and the, half the plane is on fire? When you're finally like, oh, alhamdulillah, we made it, <laughs> right? We're, we're in Hawaii and all like the white people on the plane are clapping. You're like, oh, sick, right? And then the plane catches on fire. So much can go wrong. So much can go wrong. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets things right. And it's only by his permission, bi amri. Only by his permission. Do you guys get what I mean? Sorry if you guys are people who clap on planes. <laughs> I'm sorry. And then he says, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الْأَنْهَارِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also made for you like to be in your in your um, in your service uh, the rivers as well. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I love this ayah so much. He says that he allowed the shams, the sun and the moon to be in your service. Da'ibain. Da'ibain means to work. But it also means to work exhausted. Like you're running so low, like you're exhausted. You just want to stop working. And that's exactly what the sun and the moon want to do. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, What's up? Um, and another ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلُّمْ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ And all of them, they're in an orbit and they're, they're floating. And they have a very, very set orbit. They have a very set orbit. And they don't go out of orbit. لَالشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي وَلَا الْقَمْرَ سَابِقُ النَّهَارِ لَالشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي and to drink the camera, while the sun is the sun the Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says the the sun and the moon are not gonna like uh, collide. They're not gonna come together, and the day is not gonna precede the night, or the night is not gonna precede the day. Do you guys know what I mean? They're very obedient to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They literally come up at the exact time that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells them to. That's why we know the exact minute of Fajr. That's not why we know the exact minute of sunrise. That's why we know the exact minute that we're going to break our fast. That's why we know when Aisha is. Do you know what I mean? SubhanAllah. Because they don't, they're not disobedient to Allah. Ever. And this is like, every time I think of the sun and the moon, I'm like, whoa, like, they're, they're ride or dies. <laughs> right? Like, they're so obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, how? They never, ever, ever disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not for a single day. But you know what? They want to. It's crazy. They want to. And Surah Maryam, in this room, last Ramadan, we took that that the skies just want to fall. And this earth just wants to split. 
in the mountains. They just want to come crumbling down one rock after the other. They want to do all of these things. The earth literally just wants to destroy itself because of the injustice they see us doing with Allah. The heavens and the earth want to destroy themselves. Do you guys get it? They're working tirelessly, exhausted for us. And they don't want to. And the second that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know what, you're good. So you take a break. That's when the day of judgment starts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, okay, go at it. And the earth comes falling. And the sky splits. And the sun and the moon collide. Um, I'm trying to think of the ayah. It's in Jaza'amma, I believe. But anyway, it's an ayah that says that the sun and the moon collide. SubhanAllah. The earth splits and the sun is now a mile over our heads. It's no longer in the orbit that it was once, or like in, in the area that it once was. In the galaxy, SubhanAllah. Do you have the ayah? I think it's yeah. on the second side. What is it? Oh. It does, yeah. In the second half, I believe, right? Yeah. It's interesting. I think so. I could be. What was this, sir? Yeah. Okay, I need to find it when I go. Now? Maybe. Or are you thinking of a taqweer? Yeah, oh, sorry. What's okay? <laughs> it's bothering me now. <laughs> um, and so like, subhanAllah, all of these things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in our service. All of them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in our service to benefit us as sustenance for us. Rizqan lakum. Wasakhara lakum. Wasakhara lakum. Wasakhara lakum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put these things in our service. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآتَاكُم مِّن كُلِّ مَا سَأَلْتُمُ And He provided you, He gave to you from everything that you asked Him for. Anything that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He granted us. And you're probably thinking, now, Rayyan, I have some du'as that are unanswered. I love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, min. وَآتَاكُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ مَا سَأَلْتُمُ He doesn't say, وَآتَاكُمْ كُلِّ مَا سَأَلْتُمُ He doesn't say, I, gi I gave you everything you ask me. He said, I gave you from everything you ask me for. And so anything that we ask Allah SWT for, know that Allah SWT gave us at least a fraction of that. Actually think about it. If you're asking Allah SWT, Ya Allah, allow me to do good in school, allow me to ace my exam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you feel this or allow you to feel this one and then he'll make you ace the rest. Do you know what I mean? If you say, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, grab me a crazy meal tonight, right? And then your mom cooks something that you don't like and you're like, yeah, that is crazy, right? <laughs> like, min kulli ma He gave you from everything that you asked him for. Every single human being, all of us, have a sense of shelter. Even people who are homeless. They have a sense of shelter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the sky is a shelter for us. You know what I mean? Everyone has a sense of shelter. Everyone has a sense of food. Everyone has a sense of belonging. Everyone has a sense of community. Sure, some people have it more than others. But when it comes down to it, everyone has at least a fraction of that. You guys know what I mean? And then he says, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا and if you were to try and count the blessings of Allah, you would never be able to enumerate them. Indeed, mankind, man, like human beings, are super, are super unjust, they're unfair, and they're kafar. They're super ungrateful. SubhanAllah. And remember what kafar means? It means that they're ungrateful to the point where they don't even believe that there's blessings behind something. Where they don't even see the good and the bad, they just focus on the negative. 
You know what I mean? And that's where we'll end today. But inshallah, on the papers that you guys have, I want you guys for five minutes, or actually let's take three minutes. I want you guys to write down the blessings of Allah that he gave you. And literally don't stop. Don't stop around the room and everyone will give a few. So Raha, we'll start with you. You are. I'll say one. One? Yeah. I'm Muslim. That you're Muslim. Okay, cool. I'm Muslim, but like my family. Your family, okay. So my family. Your family, okay. I feel like the first couple of ones are probably family and Islam. They probably choose their family. Okay. And? Um, um, so you're able to read? Okay. Perfect. Yep. Um, I don't know, like a sound in my own head. Once I'm in my limbs and I'm back. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Like, going to like water. Because I don't know, I was thinking of big students, but I answered the girls and uh, he couldn't make the water bigger and we wouldn't think. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Good to, to... Subhanallah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry? The dean. The dean. Okay. So I have questions for you guys. So you said that you're Muslim, but what do you do with your Islam? Try to know it more. Try to know it more. And, and that is a blessing as well, correct? No. Like even that motivation, that drive to, to want to know more is a blessing because a lot of people don't have that. And then you were saying family. But I've, a lot of people have family, but they don't have good relationships with their families. They have a good relationship. Yeah. They'd be good to your parents. Mm -hmm. Even your ability to to recognize that that's something you should do is a blessing as well. You know what I mean? Especially our parents. Exactly, especially your parents. And then you were saying your ability to read. And subhanAllah, I have that down as well. But a lot of people can read, but they don't understand what they're reading. And then a lot of people can understand what they're reading, but they don't have comprehension as they're reading. It doesn't hit their hearts. It just hits their brains. You know what I mean, subhanAllah? Right. And so like, subhanAllah, for example, I put my ears. I'm so grateful for my ears. But there are millions of people who have ears that don't have hearing. So now I have to be grateful for my hearing. And then what falls under hearing? What can I do with my hearing? Understanding. Comprehending, understanding, having relationships with people, being able to have conversations, being able to seek knowledge through through hearing, being able to watch podcasts, and those podcasts can cha change my life. You know what I mean? Like, just so many branches and branches and branches. Okay, let's go around again. Another one. Yeah. Uh, can fast. That you can fast. Okay. Yeah. Quran. Quran, okay. Mm-hmm. Like it's your, our central level. Mm -hmm. Your school. Your school. Okay. Transportation. Sorry? Transportation. Transportation. It's a good one. Uh, love. Love. Mm -hmm. Like nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah. Okay, so when you're like the ability to fast, okay, subhanallah. What blessings can you find in that other than just that? It's healthy. Sorry? It's healthy. It's healthy for you. Yeah, what else? Yeah. So you're grateful for that and Allah loves it. You're grateful for that as well. Exactly, yes. Yeah. It helps you become more patient. So that's another blessing. Staying away from bad. Staying away from bad that's another, another blessing. Oh. makes you appreciate what you don't have yes and then you said love and the first thing i thought about is a lot of people have a lot of love but they have no one to give it to they don't have family they don't have friends they don't have pets they don't have significant others so like even the fact that we have people like that and we have animals like that subhanallah in that is a blessing as well can you guys count the blessings of allah like, can you guys sit down and try to count them? If I gave you guys more than 
the four or five minutes that I gave you guys? Would you guys stop writing? Maybe your hand would cramp up. <laughs> right? It's a panel. Our body, like, wake up and there's so much that Allah does for us that we don't have, like, we don't have knowledge. Mm -hmm. Exactly, subhanAllah. Even the ability to breathe. Like, subhanAllah. Even Kay Ali radiallahu anhu. It's like a TMI narration. But I just finished reading um, uh, Sabr and Shukr by Ibn al-Qayyim. Ibn al-Qayyim is my imam crush, by the way, guys. Like, I'm, <laughs> I don't even know how the guy looks, but <laughs> no, I'm in love with him. But anyways, so in this book, he was saying that Ali radiallahu anhu, after he would like go to the washroom, he would rub his stomach and he would say, Alhamdulillah, what an amazing blessing that people don't recognize. That people recognize, but they don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. Because they think, oh, like, no, I shouldn't. I shouldn't be at that level. You know what I mean? I can't remember who it was exactly. I think it was... Sulaiman alayhi salam or Dawood or Nuh. I can't remember exactly. But anyways, after they would go to the washroom, they would rub their stomach and they would say, Alhamdulillah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed me to eat. And then he allowed my body to soak up the good from that food. And then he allowed my body to relieve itself from the bad and the harm of that food. Do you know what I mean? Because what happens when people can't go to the washroom? Yeah, and then what does that lead to? And then what can that lead to? Death. Death. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> SubhanAllah. There are so many blessings around us that we either don't recognize out of like shyness or disgust or even sometimes arrogance. And there are so many other blessings around us that we don't recognize because we don't really see them. Okay, I'm going to just really um, humble myself right now. I hate bugs, you guys. Like, bugs are my biggest fear in this. They're my only fear in this dunya. I'm actually not afraid of anything. Like, I will jump in the ocean. I will skydive. I will climb, like, a building. I'll, like, walk on tight. Like, whatever it is, right? I am not afraid of anything, alhamdulillah, except bugs. If a bug comes near me, I will actually cry. And there's a 100% chance that I will. Like, I'm actually not joking. If not cry, I like, a tear will come down. Like, I'll start tearing. Um, and then I can't kill them either because I'll feel bad. I think I mentioned in like a couple lectures that one time I was like vacuuming the basement. I was like, let me be a good sister and vacuum my brother's room. And there's a centipede, literally, you guys. It was the biggest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And I vacuumed it like out of like shock, right? <laughs> I sat on his bed for 20 minutes crying. And so like when it comes to bugs, I'm terrified of them. I can't like I can't stand them. Again, like a bug took down Nimrud. You know, you know Nimrud, the king in the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, like the tyrant, a flea, you guys, a tiny flea, flew up his nose and it started flying around in his head. And then Nimrud would, there's one narration that says that he would grab his own shoe and hit himself in the head with it to try to kill the flea. Or another narration says that he would get his servant to do it, that he would grab the shoe hit himself in the head with it to get rid of the flea. Anyway, that killed him. because <laughs> But he was taking so many blows to his head because of this flea inside his head. But there are so many benefits that bugs bring. So many. There are so many blessings in bugs, subhanAllah. Do you guys get it? So there are so many blessings around us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَمَّا بِنَعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَأَمَّا بِنَعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Make them known. Talk about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a lot of times we have good things within ourselves that we get shy to talk about. You know what I mean? Like, for example, a lot of people say that I'm eloquent, for example, that I, I have a way with words. And for the longest time, I didn't accept this. For the longest time, I was like, me? No, I couldn't even put two sentences together. I sound like a donkey, right? For the longest time. And then I got to a point where I was like, Rayyan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you this blessing and you're acting like it's not there. Do you know what I mean? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a talent, why are you going to act like he didn't? That's injustice to the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's literally you taking the blessing of Allah, covering it up like, nah, nah, I'm not that great. Like, no, I don't have that, that good quality. And instead you're choosing to disbelieve 
And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to make you good. Do you know what I mean? And so self, like uh, self-deprecation and like self, um, self-loathing, ultimately it comes down to ingratitude. And this is something that I know personally because I experienced this for years. Like I, I really, really hated myself for years and years and years. And it's because shaitan got me to a point where I was like, there's nothing good in me. And what is that the definition of? Kafar. Just the ultimate disbelief and the blessings of Allah. Do you guys get it? And so to see good in yourself, to recognize good within yourself, that's showing the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's adam al-i'tiraf bi na'matillah. That's showing the intensity of your understanding of the blessings of Allah. It's, it's crazy and it's beautiful when you get to that point, subhanAllah. Anyways, um, I do need to end it right now, inshallah. Um, anything that you guys took that was good and beneficial came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that you guys took that was bad, non-beneficial, evil, it came from myself and shaitan. has nothing to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I said anything to offend anyone, please forgive me and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me as well. Everything that I said today was a reminder to myself before I was to anyone else. I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows me to benefit from these lectures more than anyone else does. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم اجعل منهم يا الله سبحانه وتعالى ميكس أمانسو